Hello everyone! Principled argumentation can often be very intimidating because it's usually unclear where we should begin with our analysis. Should we always run principles in the exact same way? Do we have to build it up from scratch? How do I know if something is morally intuitive enough and when should I stop arguing? There are obviously no definite answers for any of these questions and it will often depend not only on the motion but also on how your opponent may attempt to contest your principle. So remember, the most important function of a principle in a debate is to forward a value system that you believe should be a primary metric in which the debate should be judged. And remember that principles exist alongside with and exist even independent of other outcomes in a debate. And so the degree to which this will happen will also vary in many debates. And that's why principled argumentation is, I think, a very beautiful component that adds a lot of um, meat to your speeches. Having said this, I want to start off this series on arguing principles with a simple rule of thumb. Formulate a principle vis-a-vis -vis the way in which opposition can formulate their best principle. In other words, start off your principled analysis by explaining what the likely principle opposition is to forward, be as charitable as possible, and then explain why you believe this to be wrong and then you can proceed to defend your alternative principled position. In my opinion, this is a very strong and aggressive way to make sure that your principle is not value neutral or easily agreeable in a debate. You want to make it directly engaging from the very beginning so that opposition has to respond to your version of how the exchange would go instead of them having the opportunity to reframe it on their own terms during their own presentation of their principle. So let me start with a very uh, fairly rich example that I think I'd want to use for this video. If the motion were, this house would allow soldiers to sue the government for negligence during warfare committed by either the government or by military officials, you may be thinking of various principles that you could run in the first speech. You could talk, for example, about the right to sue for soldiers and why this should still apply even during times of warfare or even for actions that are committed as a consequence of warfare. You could talk about the principle of command responsibility, that governments and military officials are wholly or, if not, mostly responsible for the operational conduct of war, and thus negligence can be assigned to them. Or lastly, you could even talk about the principle of a just war, that it is a morally relevant consequence to uphold better conduct of war, and thus, this necessitates a check and balance mechanism through the possibility of allowing soldiers to file a suit. Now, these are all very good principles, and you probably can run them separately in some way. But in my opinion, there is a far more efficient way to go about this by using the rule of thumb that I mentioned earlier. Instead, what I would propose is the following. Knowing that opposition may likely forward a principle on the moral justification for wars of necessity, that national security is more important than the individual autonomy of soldiers, I would immediately formulate a principle in this way. Opposition may justify this prohibition by saying that soldiers consented to serving their country and sacrificing some of their individual rights for the sake of the greater collective, which is the state. And for them, they may say that the efficient and expedient conduct of war is more important than anything else. At government, we argue that we cannot determine whether war is morally good or not because the terrifying consequences of war can be asymmetric and the justifications for these wars do not always meet the bar of justifying the long-term unforeseeable damage that can be caused as a consequence of engaging in this war. For this reason, we must defer to what is more approximate and guaranteed, and that if we can demonstrate that opposition guarantees the instrumentalization of soldiers for ends that they cannot exercise recourse against, then it is simply immoral not to allow them to file for suit against their own governments. Notice that what I'm doing here is not necessarily abandoning all the stuff I said earlier. We will still talk about checks and balances, we will still talk about command responsibility, but now we've formulated the headline umbrella of this entire principle through the moral framework of proximity to outweigh opposition's argument 
on justifying their model through its expediency to save lives. So hopefully, this example illustrates my point well enough, which is that we need to start our argumentation for principles by understanding how opposition will formulate their principle. And we don't have to operate on our worst case all the time. It's actually in our interest to operate on their best case on how they will formulate their principle so that it's easier for us to create a more comprehensive principle that captures the best and worst cases of opposition side. All right, that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.